Well, hello everyone. I wanted to go ahead and, and make a uh, lecture video to talk about some of the uh, different types of sleep issues and sleep problems that people have. Uh, some people refer to these as sleep disorders. I don't like using that term because some of these things really aren't disorders. Uh, they are just basically uh, issues. Some are, are more severe than others, uh, but uh, not everything requires a trip to go see the, the doctor about. And so because of that, I like to refer to them as disorders rather than disturbances. Excuse me, disturbances rather than disorders. So let's go ahead and get started. Probably one of the most common type of sleep disturbances that we see uh, people suffering from is what is called insomnia. Uh, and to be honest with you, insomnia is, is there's more than one type. In fact, when it comes to insomnia, uh, insomnia is often known as the inability to fall off to sleep. And that makes perfect sense, the inability to fall off to sleep. You can't turn around and, and go, to, uh, go to sleep. You're, you're in bed, it's 10 o'clock, 10 turns into 11, 11 turns into 12, 12 turns into 1 a.m., and you're still awake. That's one type of insomnia. Another type of insomnia is when you go to bed, let's just say at 10 o'clock, and you fall off to sleep fine, but then you turn around and you wake up, and in the process of waking up, you can't fall back to sleep. So that's a different type of insomnia. One type is the inability to fall off to sleep, and another type of insomnia is the inability to fall back to sleep. So there really are two different types. In fact, there is a third one, and this is what we refer to as frequent night awakenings. Frequent night awakenings. You may go to bed at 10 o'clock, you may wake up eight hours later at 6 a.m., but in the middle of that uh, eight hour period, maybe you got up four or more times and you were up anywhere from 20 to 45 minutes or longer each time, uh, so you really didn't get a good night's sleep. When it comes to uh, insomnia, we all go through it once in a while. We get uh, anxious, we get nervous, we, uh, we are really even energized about something coming down, uh, down the pipe, so to speak, and so we don't sleep well. So the fact that it happens to people occasionally is not a reason to go run off and see the doctor or go get a sleep test or I have to go see my psychologist because I didn't sleep well last night. The real issue is if it goes on continuously. That's, that's the big concern. Does it happen? continuously okay in that regard now as far as treating it what I tell people is this a lot of people when I ask in class what is the worst thing you can do uh, if you find yourself wide awake in the middle of the night and unable to fall off to sleep and I hear things that are very accurate such as playing on your phone or turning around and uh, uh, you know uh, turning on all the lights that's very true but some people are surprised about the worst thing you can possibly do if you are suffering from insomnia and that is just to lay there that's right it is just to lay there that is the worst thing you can do um, it has been suggested that if you're suffering from insomnia get up find something to do uh, but don't just lay there okay maybe read a book maybe get a few things done uh, that may help you to to get going so that you can eventually fall back to sleep but just laying there sometimes is the worst thing other issues and and I can speak about quite a few but other issues is body temperature uh, working out right before you fall off to sleep can cause insomnia because it raises your body temperature um, if your house or apartment or home is quite warm during the summer um, it's difficult to fall off to sleep. Doing anything you can to bring the temperature down in the area that you sleep uh, is a good thing. Uh, some people will even take a cool shower to help lower the temperature in their body. Not a cold shower, not ice cold. You don't want to be miserable. But a hot shower definitely is not a good idea. That can raise body temperature. All right? And there are other suggestions and other ideas too. Uh, sometimes there is a blood sugar imbalance depending upon what you eat before you go to bed can actually cause you to have insomnia. Some things that can write an insure, uh, sugar imbalance can include uh, uh, breads, uh, dairy products, assuming you're not lactose intolerant, um, you know, and things of that sort. Uh, a cold glass of water is far better uh, than um, 
you know, a hot drink or something like that. So those are just some ideas, and, and there are more. But uh, know the different types of insomnia and know some of the treatments as well. Another type of disturbance that is almost completely different, uh, uh, insomnia is the inability to fall back to sleep. Narcolepsy is the inability to stay awake. All right. And when it comes to narcolepsy, narcolepsy is actually a neurological disorder. We see this in individuals. It is a bit rare or so I'm told it's rare, but a person can turn around and have something similar to a, uh, a seizure. And when they have the seizure, it's like a brainstorm, an electrical, electrochemical brainstorm going on in the head. And instead of the body physically seizing up, they fall off to sleep. And this is not a state of sleep where you can just nudge them with an elbow and wake them back up. They may be asleep anywhere from two to 30 minutes, and you might not be able to bring them out of it very easily. Uh, there's an example of uh, uh, a time where a friend of mine and his wife, um, we were out having dinner uh, with my wife and I, and uh, my wife and this this gal they just got the giggles they started laughing at something and she had a narcoleptic attack and so she fell from the table uh and and basically fell off to sleep and at first people tried not to pay attention but then some people started to panic thinking uh you know oh my gosh is she is she been hurt and her husband knew that no she just had a narcoleptic attack actually it was the first one in, in many many months and things of that sort but within about 10 minutes she was fine and very embarrassed but all all was okay <laughs> and things went on as far as treatment for this to be quite honest there is no cure for narcolepsy. There are medications that can control how active, how often it occurs, but unfortunately there's no pill you can give a person to make this kind of stuff go away. Another type is what is called somnambulism, and this is something that I've asked in class before. Uh, somnambulism is a very fancy word for walking in your sleep, okay? That's what it basically is, is walking in your sleep in that regard, uh, AKA sleepwalking. And I've asked students if they knew someone who sleepwalks or if they themselves sleepwalks. And I usually get a lot of stories, people sharing stories of roommates that, you know, walk out the front door or uh, uh, family members that walk down the stairs, um, you know, people that tend to end up eating. That's actually happened while they're sleepwalking. They end up in the kitchen, make themselves a bite to eat, but they're not even really awake. Um, we've heard stories of people turning around and sitting in their car, and some even claim they've gotten in their car uh, and drove off and things like that. So uh, somnobulism is a stage in three reaction. It actually happens in the deepest level of non-REM sleep, in three. And it, it really leaves a lot to, uh, to the imagination that this kind of stuff can happen. I show you the picture there in the slide of the person walking uh, with their hands out and their eyes closed. You know, their hands are designed to guide them. That's not how most people turn around and sleepwalk. They are, their eyes are actually open, their hands are at their sides, and things of that sort. Okay. We even, this is an interesting one, have heard lately of people doing what we call sleep texting. They text while they're sleeping. Imagine that. They text while they're sleeping. All right. So that can happen as well. Uh, is it dangerous to wake a sleepwalker? The studies actually find the old, uh, the old adage that you should never wake a sleepwalker because it causes mental problems is not true. It causes embarrassment. Uh, but sometimes it's hard to wake them up. Really, the easiest thing to do is try to guide a person back to their bed. That, that is the, the easiest thing. Uh, even my children, when they were young, uh, would occasionally sleepwalk and things of that sort. But it is not uh, uh, an automatically damaging thing. I mean, a person can injure themselves. Uh, those have their stories of people that have fallen downstairs or taken a spill and, and injured themselves. So there's no guarantee that stuff won't happen. But, um, you know, it's, it's not a, a mental uh, disorder of sorts or anything like that. There is also what is called somniloquy. Somniloquy is talking in your sleep. 
And um, somniloquy a lot of times can be along the same lines. People talk in their sleep and they can sometimes interact with others a little bit, but it's very fragmented and it doesn't always make sense and things of that sort. But both of these are in three reactions. These are not dreams in an R stage. Sometimes people have found, a science has found that they're dreaming, get this, in a non-REM stage, in an N3 stage. That's what's happening with somnobulism and somniloquy, okay? So these people, um, you know, can happen to a great many people. Uh, it's more uh, apt to happen during sleep deprivation. Um, you know, they can injure themselves and hurt themselves. And what we're finding is they can do a great many things, all right? We'll actually talk about that in class, just what all can you do while sleepwalking somnobulism. The last one I want to mention here is called sleep apnea. People who suffer from sleep apnea a lot of times tend to snore very loudly. Um, they will make a tremendous amount of noise as they sleep uh, because they're taking in this, this large volume of air. But what is very fascinating about that is that once they are done uh, taking in that air, they go without breathing. They go without breathing anywhere from 10 or 15 seconds to, you know, 45 seconds or a minute. Uh, I've had some students try to tell me they knew people that went without breathing for three and four and five minutes. And I don't know that I believe that. That's, that's leading into brain damage and stuff like that due to oxygen deprivation. But, uh, you know, sleep apnea um, can be a very serious problem. Now, sleep apnea in... Um, in adults is a, an inconvenience. It can be due to obesity. Uh, there can be, uh, because of a person's sheer weight, it can cause a, uh, a blockage of the air passageways. Um, it can cause adults to not get a good night's sleep. They have these uh, CPAP machines to help with that. Um, the lack of quality sleep can cause a breakdown in your immune system and make you more apt to get sick, flu, colds, and things like that. So it's annoyance for sure in adults. Okay, it has the potential to be possibly deadly in infants. Possibly deadly. We're talking about something called SIDS, Sudden Infant Death Syndrome. Sudden Infant Death Syndrome. It is the number one killer of infants under age one. And the fact of the matter is that uh, uh, some people refer to this as crib death. That uh, infants, sometimes when they're born premature, run the risk of suffering from sudden infant death syndrome. And the reason is this, babies when they are born, believe it or not, the one thing that is not well completely developed is their brain. And their brain actually develops its neural pathways and things like that while they sleep, while they sleep. And uh, REM sleep is very important to a newborn. And because of that, excuse me, because of that, um, if an infant is born premature, that's all the less development of the brain that has occurred. And in some cases with sudden infant death syndrome, the reason why an infant dies is because the brain forgets to tell them to breathe or it does not tell them to breathe while they are sleeping. All right? It does not send that message. When they the uh, baby was in the womb of the mother. The mother took care of all those things. Uh, the baby didn't have to worry about that. But when, you know, a baby uh, is obviously born uh, and disconnected from the mother, then the brain has to handle that. There are uh, apnea monitoring devices, sleep apnea monitoring devices that uh, are created that can be given to families if their child is an apnea risk or a SIDS risk. And uh, what it does is it, it basically uh, uh, pays special attention to their breathing, okay? And if they stop breathing, then the uh, apnea monitor goes off. It creates a whistle or a bell or a shrill. And the idea is that the baby wakes up and hopefully mom and dad as well to make sure the baby is okay. But the baby wakes up and when they do, they go back to breathing. Okay, the, they're, they're conscious and so the brain tells them to breathe. And they might wake up crying because of this loud piercing sound, but at least they wake up and they're breathing and stuff like that. Um, and a lot of times, given time, they do grow out of that. And, and that is definitely a good thing. So these are the four types that I want you to know, okay? 
and uh, paid close attention to. And, uh, uh, you know, we will cover more a little bit later. Take care.